anyway, today I'm very happy to present two amazing poets. Um, and we're going to start with uh, Richard Blanco and Patricia Smith. And we're going to start with Richard Blanco. Um, his acclaimed first book of poetry, City of a Hundred Fires, what a wonderful title, received the Agnes Starrett Poetry Prize from the University of Pittsburgh Press in 1998. His second book, Directions to the Beach of the Dead, won the Beyond Margins Award from the Penn American Center for its continued exploration of the university themes of cultural, universal themes of cultural identity and homecoming. A third collection, Looking for the Gulf Motel, was, uh, again, another wonderful title. I think I'm gonna call you when I'm making titles. Was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2012. Blanco is a recipient of two Florida Art Artist Fellowships, a residency fellowship from the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and is a John Charty Fellow of the Bread Loaf Writers Conference. Um, I think that what's wonderful about Richard Blanco's work is the way that it is both serious and funny, the way it makes you laugh and cry all within the same poem. Let's welcome Richard Blanco. Thank you, everyone, and it's uh, great to be back here again after a while, a long while, right? <laughs> Is uh, this all right? Everybody can hear me? So I um, wanted to give you just a little bit of uh, context to my work. Um, I grew up, uh, I'm the child of exile, Cuban parents, or as my official bio says, I was made in Cuba, assembled in Spain, and imported to the United States, <laughs> which means my mother left Cuba when she was seven months pregnant with me. I was to Madrid, I was born, it was a pit stop, not an emergency pit stop, but 45 days later, we moved to the United States. And so by the time I was 45 days old, I had lived in three countries now, theoretically, and uh, two states. So um, that was kind of an ironic sort of foreshadowing of the things that would obsess my work or, or which my work would center around. Um, in Miami, especially added to that is growing up in Miami is not the Miami of the night of today but the Miami of the 1970s which was an even more enclosed uh, cultural bubble than it was uh, than it is now I mean everybody was Cuban the grocer was Cuban the all my classmates were Cuban the one guy that got picked on was Brian Kunkel because of his last name and he had freckles and we had never seen that before um, and so there was I grew up in, in these two imaginary worlds one was the Cuba that my parents were always talking about that wonderful paradise they left or had to leave that we were going back someday supposedly um, but all the relatives and all the stories and the house and uh, where your grandfather was born and all this stuff. And the other, the other, um, <clears throat> the other imaginary world, which is, which is in, in the writing too, was America. I mean, is living in Miami, as I just said, was not quite living in America. Was, Miami was kind of a purgatory on the way to America. <laughs> and we, re we really, really did believe that there was this place like the Brady Bunch or Leave It to Beaver. We, I really thought that existed because I didn't know any better. Everything else around me was so different. Um, any case, um, so the family has always been a center of, of my work for those reasons. Uh, and although now that I've hit my early 20s, um, <laughs> I kind of still feel a little odd, a little bit weird still writing about family and childhood, and I, why do I keep on coming back to that? And it's more than the cultural, I, I think it's, it's a sense of grounding that, the, that culture brings, a sense of folklore that I have never quite been able to find in American consumerism and Hollywood, and I haven't quite found the Leave it to Beaver house either. And so I keep on coming to family as a way of grounding myself in some kind of folklore. But besides all that jazz, Family is just, writing about family is just a way, big, a way of really asking those very big questions about loss and memory and mortality. And, and, I, think, and I think we all, we all know that, especially the writers in the room. So I'll be reading from the third book, uh, which I think you'll see those currents uh, definitely coming in through. And, and a few new things that I think happened for me in this third book. This first poem, Looking for the Gulf Motel, um, happened uh, in Miami, well, in Marco Island, there's a quote by Cesare Pavesi <laughs> that says, you need a village if only for the pleasure of leaving it. 
And that, that village for me has always been Miami, and I have this constant love-hate relationship that I keep on going back to. And anyway, in one of those trips, I went to the West Coast, which, to Marco Islands, which is a place we used to vacation a lot, poor man's vacation, traveling from one coast to the other. And uh, everything had changed, as anyone who's been to Florida knows, everything changes about every five minutes with development. And suddenly I felt erased from the landscape. And I, more importantly, I felt the same feelings that my parents that my parents had when they were to talk about Cuba or when I visited my mother with Cuba, that sense of how everything's changed and going on and on and on about this nostalgic dribble. And it seemed to me now Marco Island had become yet now my Cuba, another island lost. Looking for the Gulf Motel. There should be nothing here I don't remember. The Gulf Motel with mermaid lampposts and ship's wheel in the lobby should still be rising out of the sand like a cake decoration. My brother and I should still be pretending we don't know our parents, embarrassing us as they roll the luggage cart past the front desk, loaded with our scruffy suitcases, two dozen loaves of Cuban bread, brown bags bulging with enough mangoes to last the entire week, our espresso pot, the pressure cooker, and a pork roast leaking, reeking garlic through the entire lobby. <laughs> All because we can't afford to eat out, not even on vacation, only two hours from our home in Miami, but far enough away to be thrilled by the whiter sands on the west coast of Florida, where I should still be for the first time watching the sun set instead of rise over the ocean. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My mother should still be in the kitchenette of the Gulf Motel, her daisy sandals from Kmart squeaking across the linoleum, still gorgeous in her teal swimsuit and amber earrings, stirring a pot of arroz con pollo, adding sprinkles of onion powder and dollops of tomato sauce. My father should still be in a terry cloth jacket, smoking, clinking a glass of amber whiskey in the sunset at the Gulf Motel, watching us dive into the pool, two boys he'll never see grow into men who will be proud of him. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My brother and I should still be playing Parcheesi. My father should still be alive, slow dancing with my mother on the sliding glass balcony of the Gulf Motel. No music, only the waves keeping time, a song, only their minds here 10,000 nights back to their life in Cuba. My mother's face should still be resting against his bare chest, like the moon resting on the sea. The stars should still be turning around them. There should be nothing here. I don't remember. My brother should still be 13, sneaking rum in the bathroom, sculpting naked women from sand, and I should still be eight years old, dazzled by seashells, and how many seconds I hold my breath underwater. But I'm not. I'm 38, driving up Collier Boulevard, looking for the Gulf Motel, for everything that should still be, but isn't. I want to blame the condos, their shadows for ruining the beach and my past. I want to chase the snowbirds away with their tacky McMansions and yachts. I want to turn the golf courses back into mangroves. I want to find the Gulf Motel, exactly as it was, and pretend for a moment that nothing I've lost is lost. Thank you. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's the title poem of the book, obviously, which I think sets the theme for the book. And it's a lot about loss and memory. And you can't help that when you're a Cuban ex or a child of Cuban exile. Um, this next poem, we're going to switch up a little bit. <laughs> uh, the, the Miss America pageant was a really big deal at our house. Something that still perplexes me. Um, and probably not for the reasons you would think. Uh, we were certainly not the Smiths or the Johnsons or the, <laughs> or, or the Cleavers, for that matter, <laughs> sitting around watching the Miss America pageant. And anyway, this is a, a somewhat humorous attempt to try to capture those, those memories or that memory and try to make some sense out of it. It's called Betting on America. My grandmother was the bookie. Yep, set up at the kitchen table that night, her hair and curlers, pencil and pad jotting $2 bets, paying five to one on which miss would take the crown that year. 
Abuelo put his money on Miss Wyoming. She's got great teeth, he pronounced, as if complimenting a horse, not her smile filling the camera before she whisked away in a cloud in her creamy chiffon dress. I dug up enough change from the sofa and car seats to bet on Miss Wisconsin, thinking I was as American as she was because I was as blonde as she was, and I knew that's where all the cheese came from. <laughs> that wasn't all I knew. Chocolate was from Miss Pennsylvania. The capital of Miss Montana was Helena. Mount Rushmore was in Miss South, South Dakota. And I knew how to say Miss Connecticut. <laughs> Unlike my tia Gloria, who just pointed at the TV, esa, esa, that one, claiming she had her same figure before leaving Cuba. It's true, es verdad. I have pictures, she declared, before cramming another bocadito sandwich into her mouth. <laughs> Papa refused to bet on any of the misses because Americanas don't have any ass, he complained. <laughs> There's nothing like a big culo cubano. <laughs> Everyone agreed, it's verdad, es verdad except for me and my little cousin Julito, who apparently was a breast man by age five, <laughs> reaching for Miss Alabama's bosom on the screen, the leggy mulata sashaying in pumps, swimsuit, seducing Tio Pedro into picking her as the sure winner. She's the one. She looks guana, he swore, and she did, but she cost him five bucks. Cojone, he exploded as confetti rained, Burt Parks leading Miss Ohio, the new Miss America, by the hand to the runway. Gloves up to her elbows, velvet down to her feet, crying diamonds into her bouquet, the queen of our country, our land of the free, amid the purple mountains of Her Majesty, floating across the stage and our living room, though no one bet on her, and none of us, not even me, could answer mama when she asked, Donde esta Ohio? <laughs> I'm glad you got That's what I get asked now when I was moving to Maine. Donde esta Maine? <laughs> For Cubans, America sort of starts at New York <laughs> and sort of somewhere around North Carolina. <laughs> at Florida Room. Not a study or a den, but El Florida, as my mother called it, a pretty name for the room with the prettiest view of the lipstick red hibiscus puckered up against the windows, the tepid breeze laden with brown sugar scents of loquats drifting in from the yard. Not a sunroom, but where the sun both rose and set, all day the shadows of banana trees fan dancing across the floor, and if it rained, it rained the loudest like marbles plunking across the roof under constant threat of coconuts ready to fall from the sky. Not a sitting room, but El Florida, where I sat alone for hours with butterflies frozen on the polyester curtains and faces of Yadro figurines, sad angels, clowns, princesses with eyes glazed blue and gray, grazing from behind, glazing from behind the glass doors of the wall cabinet. Not a TV room, but where I watched Creature Feature as a boy, clinging to my brother, safe from vampires in the same sofa where I fell in love with Clint Eastwood and my abuelo watching westerns, or pitying women crying in telenovelas with my abuela. Not a family room, but the room where my father twirled his hair while listening to eight tracks of Elvis, read Nietzsche a few months before he died where my mother learned to dance alone as she swept, and I learned salsa pressed against my tia Julia's enormous press. At the edge of the city, in the company of crickets, beside the empty clotheslines, telephone wires, and the moon, tonight, my life is an old friend sitting with me, not in the living room, but in the light of El Florida, as quiet and necessary as any of the stars shining above it. And this one is for Maria. <laughs> uh, one thing, new thing that I became interested in this book is the, the, 
this whole intersection between sexual identity and cultural identity. And so where do those two meet or collide or whatnot? And then enter my grandmother, who was as homophobic as she was xenophobic. <laughs> so that anything that appeared strange or weird culturally was also labeled as sheer faggotry. So I am talking things like Legos, Fruit Loops, Play-Doh. Anything she didn't understand was gay. <laughs> so, uh, so my childhood was hell in that regard. Um, <laughs> but um, I wrote this poem uh, first thinking it was this scaly sort of angry poem. And the first time I read it, some, someone chuckled. And as I kept on reading, more people chuckled. And I started chuckling. And then soon the room was roaring. And I thought, damn, she, I still can't even get back at her. <laughs> Somehow she manipulated this poem into being a humorous, loving poem about her <laughs> in some ways. I think in between the lines, it's not. But anyway, this is in her voice, and it's called Queer Theory According to My Grandmother. I need water for that one. So she begins. Never drink your soda with a straw. Milkshakes? Maybe. Stop buying your mother's Avon catalog and the men's underwear in those Sears flyers. I've seen you. Stay out of her Tupperware parties and perfume bottles. Don't let her kiss you. She kisses you much too much. Avoid hugging men, but if you must, pat them real hard on the back, even if it's your father. Must you keep that cat? Don't pet him so much. Ay, mijo, why don't you like dogs? Never play house, even if you're the husband. <laughs> Quit hanging out with that Henry kid. He's too pale, and I don't care what you call them, those G.I. Joes of his are dolls. <laughs> don't draw rainbows or flowers or sunsets. I've seen you. <laughs> don't draw at all. No coloring books either. Put away your crayons, your Play-Doh, your Legos. Where are your Hot Wheels, your laser gun and handcuffs, the knives I gave you? <laughs> Never fly a kite or roller skate, but light all the firecrackers you want. Kill all the lizards you can. Cut up worms. Feed them to that cat of yours. <laughs> Don't sit Indian style with your legs crossed, mijo. You're not an Indian. Stop click clacking your sandals. You're not a chorus girl. For God's sake, Never pee sitting down. I've seen you. Never take a bubble bath or wash your hair with shampoo. Shampoo is for women. So is conditioner, so is mousse, so is hand lotion. Never file your nails or blow dry your hair. Go to the barber shop with your grandfather. You're not unisex, are you? <laughs> Stay out of the kitchen. Men don't cook. They eat. Eat anything you want except deviled eggs, blow pops, croissants, cucumber sandwiches, and petite fours. Don't watch Bewitched or I Dream of Genie. Don't stare at the six million dollar man. I've seen you. Never dance alone in your room. Donna Summer, Barry Manilow, The Captain and Tennille, Bette Midler, all musicals forbidden. Posters of kittens, Star Wars, or the Eiffel Tower forbidden. Those fancy books on architecture and art, I threw them in the trash. You can't wear cologne or puka shells, and I better not catch you in clogs. If I see you in a ponytail, it's coming off. Que? Como? What? No, you can't pierce your ear, left or right side. I don't care. You will not look like a goddamn queer. I've seen you, even if you are one. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> Thanks for that, Patricia. Yeah, that's 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 what happened. <laughs> um, also, in this book. Uh, one thing that I hadn't uh, also been exposed to, again, now that I'm in my later 20s, um, <laughs> there is uh, witnessing a lot of the older generation of relatives pass on or get really old. And um, there was a kind of a, a different kind of loss, a different context for loss. It wasn't sort of the loss that I inherited from my parents, thinking about Cuba and all this sort of loss that was not that tangible. This is a very tangible kind of loss. And so, uh, 
the last movement in, in the book uh, has several portraits or, or tributes to some of these characters and some of these um, people in my family. And one of them is my tia Kucha, who I just was madly in love with when I was a little kid. Just couldn't get enough of her. She was like that, that great aunt, and that wonderful aunt you always wanted to go over to their house. It's called Unspoken Elegy for Tia Kucha. I arrive with a box of guava pastelitos, a dozen red carnations, and a handful of memories at her door. The half moons of her French manicures, how she spoke, blowing out cigarette smoke, her words leaving her mouth as ghosts. The music of her nicknames, Cucha, Puchita, Pucha, Puchita. I kiss her hello and she slaps me hard against my arm. Cabrón, too handsome to visit your tía, eh? She laughs, pulls me inside her efficiency. A place I thought I had forgotten comes back to life with wafts of Gina Tay and Pinesel. The same calendar from Farmacia León with scenes of old Havana on the wall. The same peppermints in a crystal dish and her wearing a papery housecoat, sneakers with pantyhose, just like she wore those summer mornings, she'd walk me down to the beach along First Street, past the washed out pinks and blues of the Art Deco hotels, standing like old toys. The retirees lined across the verandas like seagulls peering into the horizon. The mango popsicles from the bodeguita and the pier she told me was once a bridge to Cuba have all vanished. I ask how she's feeling, but we agree not to talk about that today. Though we both know why I've come to see her. In a few months, maybe weeks, her lungs will fill up again and her heart will stop for good. She too will vanish, except what I remember of her and this afternoon, sharing a pastelito over a cafe she sweetens with equal at her dinette table crowded with boxes of low-salt saltines and fibery cereals. Under the watch of Holy Jesus' heart burning on the wall, we gossip about the secret crush she had on my father once. She counts exactly how many years and months since she left Cuba and her mother forever. We complain about the wars, disease, fires blazing on the midday news as she dunks the carnations in a tumbler and a dozen red suns burst in the sapphire sky, framed in the window, sitting by the table. I, well, uh, I guess what's happened is that over time, I mean, the Cuban exile community and what my family was always talking about going back is becoming more of a, uh, a dream that's slipping away, and almost sl slipped away already. Um, and so over time, what I've, what I've seen is I've, I've had to lose what they've lost all, all over again. So in some ways, I didn't realize that uh, as I was growing younger, they still instilled in me this idea that sometime, someday we'd go back uh, to Cuba. And uh, the other thing that's happened is sort of Miami has changed a lot too, so I've lost, I've lost a little bit of the, the place that I felt sort of home was. And so we have that going on too. But uh, I still have one... I'm still hoping to retire with a place in Cuba someday. And this, is, this poem is about her survival in some ways. Um, I don't know if you've gotten to that point where suddenly your parents don't kind of need you and they're like, you're bugging me, <laughs> when they, instead of them bu you bugging them, uh, instead of them bugging you. And so I had this moment at the beach where there was this sort of light came over her. It's called Venus in Miami Beach. What calls her to the sea? She rises, steps towards the shore with the temperament of a bride. Her shadow, a long train pulled across the sand behind her, parting a flock of seagulls screeching away into the wind. Her swollen ankles and frail shoulders disappearing inch by inch under her body as she wades into the water, becoming as young as I remember her in a photo posing like a mermaid from my father. Once as gorgeous as her name, Hesa. Once a girl chasing fireflies who hadn't lost her home and country, sisters and husband. Once a mother who watched me as I watch her now, afraid of her alone with the sea. I wave to her, but she turns away from me, fixes her eyes on the horizon and beyond at nothing I can see. Needing no one, it seems, like Venus's gaze, I'm tempted to think, 
born full grown out of the sea. But today, she's not a goddess or a girl, not my mother, but simply a her, floating in the circle of her own arms, a water lily, tranquil and sure of her being, being. Some days, the sea. The sea is never the same twice. Today, the waves open their lion's mouths, hungry for the shore, and I feel the earth helpless. Some days, their foamy edges are lace at my feet, the sea a sheet of green silk. Sometimes the shore brings souvenirs from a storm. I sift through spoils of seagrass, find a broken finger of coral, a torn fan, examine a sponge's hollow throat, watch a man o' war die a sapphire in the sand. Some days there's nothing but sand, quiet as snow. I walk eyes on the wind, sometimes laden with silver tasting salt, sometimes still as the sun. Some days the sun is a dollop of honey and raining light on the sea glinting diamond dust. Sometimes there are only clouds, 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 sometimes solid as continents drifting across the sky, other times wispy white roses that swirl into tigers, into cathedrals, into hands, and I remember some days I'm still a boy on this beach, wanting to catch a seagull, or a cup of tiny silver fish in my hands, build a perfect sandcastle. Some days I'm a teenager blind to death even as I watch waves seep into nothingness. Most days I'm a man tired of being a man, sleeping in the care of dust slanted light, or a man scared of being a man, seeing some god in the moonlight streaming over the sea. Some days I imagine myself walking this shore with feet as worn as driftwood, old and afraid of my body. Some day I suppose I'll return some place like waves trickling through the sand back to the sea without any memory of even being here. But if I could choose my eternity, it would be here, aging with the moon enduring in the space between every grain of sand and in the cusp of every wave and every seashell's hollow. Thank you.